we're good. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Juliet and Jeff, also for uh, preparing this symposium. Thank you, wow. everyone who's um, tuning in, both in the room and via Zoom. Um, excited to kind of share and follow James. Um, I feel like there are threads of things that you're talking about in your presentation that I feel like you'll see kind of very similarly in mine. Um, the way I approach this presentation was very much based on kind of reflecting back on my own experience learning design as a student um, and particularly as an undergrad student, and then also kind of thinking about where things have shifted since that point, um, both in terms of my design practice, but also my teaching practice. Um, so to start, I wanted to kind of highlight some of these major shifts for me that have stood out um, just again in, in this reflection about automation, um, really thinking about how design has been influenced by processes that can automate our, our actions, our steps in, in making. Um, I've also been really, you know, thoughtful in thinking about uh, screen interfaces and how um, just the way in which those have shifted based on the technology, um, based on different emergence of new sort of devices, um, but really sort of being trained to see a screen um, and what that means in terms of how we expect to see design or how our students are producing design uh, with a screen particularly in mind. Um, and then there's also been um, my interest in collaborative tools uh, ways that we can work across um, a classroom, but also as a design team, for instance, um, the emergence of tools that have really shifted our ability to, to kind of be in multiple places like Zoom right now um, and be able to engage and connect with each other. Um, and then there's also kind of my thinking around video and photo editing, different sort of tools also that have shifted the way that we can engage with video-based content or image-based content. Um, and then lastly, um, how we communicate. And so some of this overlaps inside of themselves. I feel like when I say collaborative tools that also may kind of interact with communication and file sharing, um, but you kind of see how I sort of shift and structure this in the context of my presentation. So to start, uh, I wanted to kind of highlight um, my sort of you know, um, exposure to computers, laptops, and other devices. Uh, and I'm just going to bring us back to basically this uh, Gateway 2000 computer. Uh, this was my first exposure to this growing up when I was a child. Um, I think my dad took us to like the Gateway 2000 store. Um, we got, um, you know, Microsoft Windows 98 or 95 in this case right here. Uh, and, and again, I have a lot of these kind of janky images from online that sort of try to capture what it felt like at that time um, with dial up and uh, not really understanding the full kind of like capacity of these tools. But this was like my first instance of like learning to use a computer. And this sort of overlapped with me in middle school. Uh, I think I was really sort of understanding that there was a difference between a PC. And then in, in the computer lab at school, we had a bunch of these like old school, like Mac computers. And these felt really foreign to me. I couldn't really access this yet. Uh, I felt like the graphics and like the way that you would be able to engage with it um, was still fairly new. And so I really mostly understood like how to use a PC at this early stage. But again, like I said, like this is not my specific computer lab, but this is what reminds me of what that environment was like, um, of like going to school and seeing like countless computers um, in a space like a library. And I, and I think that that kind of exposure from middle school and then even just kind of moving into high school, um, what does it mean to be working in a kind of studio culture or in a kind of uh, similar space with one another? Um, I just think a lot about what that has done to kind of think about how we sort of design. And, and then just kind of moving, you know, light years ahead of that, when I got to college, um, this was the first instance where I, I moved from like a Dell laptop computer, uh, particularly when I began to kind of do design, I, um, you know, got an iMac desktop. And I was really, I still wasn't sure about getting a laptop yet, like that it was a Mac laptop. So I, I kind of, chart this around 2008 when I got like a, again, another desktop computer 
but it was so new uh, for me because um, there was sort of this learning curve of again shifting from a PC to a Mac computer. Uh, and then, you know, as I kind of really got more comfortable on um, this platform, you know, getting a MacBook Pro was kind of the next logical step. Um, and it had this kind of portability where I could bring it with me um, and move, you know, anywhere and do design. And the last sort of device I'll just sort of include in this um, sort of snapshot is also like the emergence of like the iPod mini. Um, I had the one in the middle, the blue iPod mini. I like carried this with me everywhere. And, and again, when I think about interfaces, right? Like this was, this was new. I hadn't really seen anything quite like this, um, you know, separate from like a Game Boy, let's say, where it had kind of like a really kind of simplistic digital interface. Um, but the idea that you could carry your music in this way, moving from like a CD, uh, you know, sort of tape cassette or a CD-ROM, for instance, the idea that you could have this kind of portable small device, um, you know, thinking about that and portability more, you know, expansively has definitely shaped um, a way design can function. And, and I, I link this sort of thinking about devices and so, uh, as I think about software. Uh, and so again, jumping back in time, like my first instance of like designing, if you will, was with Microsoft Word. And I loved working and using the Word Art Gallery. Had no clue about any kind of details about what design could be or how um, type should be set. I just knew that there were at least some of these default uh, options that I could work with that could shape my trifold board presentations or my science fair projects um, or dioramas, for instance. There was just a way of thinking about color, thinking about text, thinking about the sort of expressiveness of letter forms um, in this really simplistic way um, using Microsoft Word. And, and when I got to high school, and again, I apologize for the, like, the jankiness of these images, but like this reminds me of when I um, participated in the school newspaper. And in high school, we had Quark Express. That was the, again, another first instance of really trying to think about how to do layout, how to do design. And there were so many different features that moved beyond what I understood Microsoft Word to have, that there was just a, uh, just another saturation of exposure of what could be. And so I, I think about this progression as I kind of moved from middle school to high school, the sort of sophistication of what design could look like. Um, I learned on uh, Creative Suite 3, Adobe CS3, and it came in a bundle of like, I don't know, 50 CDs. Um, I remember buying it at the school like store and then loading it up on my computer because I had, like I said, an iMac where I had slipped the CDs in um, and loaded my computer with this. And, and I think about the fact that again, from uh, having this tangible sort of software, physical, to now where we are with like sort of licensed subscriptions that, you know, are kind of not necessarily in our hands, but based on how we subscribe to these uh, platforms, it's really kind of moved from a physical to a digital, right? And, and then kind of skirting left a little bit, thinking about music, um, you know, Napster was huge as well. Napster, LimeWire, um, really thinking about how music could be shared in this sort of, again, tapping into the digital space. I think about how, you know, that this, there was such a crackdown on this sort of process of, of how we could distribute um, and move around uh, systems to be able to share our music with each other. And, and I, and, kind of connecting that to the present, I think about the shift to using Spotify. So for me, like when I think about these kind of shifts in terms of my teaching or working with students, particularly out of the pandemic era, we, um, for the graduating class in 2021, I put together a playlist using Spotify um, to really kind of play the music or, or have an access to a playlist um, that could be shared in this sort of digital fashion. And so I think about tools such as uh, Spotify in this kind of way, both in terms of um, building community, um, but also in terms of my own research. Um, I also put together a Spotify playlist 
um, in conjunction with an exhibition that I curated called With a Cast of Colored Stars. And so this was also a way for me to connect with people who were not necessarily able to get to the show, but had access to some of the music and um, information of the artists uh, that I was kind of showing kind of album cover promotional material for. And, and I, I call this out in particular because the way I integrated it into the show was that there was this ability to have like a QR code um, that Spotify had developed where if you used your phone and you had the Spotify app, you'd be able to kind of access it from your you know, digital device or your phone itself. And so I, I was thinking a lot about like, what does it mean to be kind of be in, be in this kind of after the internet space? Like how, how is my work being influenced? How am I tapping into these resources or these devices that can also push design um, another step? Um, and, and then kind of again, jumping to another sort of space is iStock. And not so much iStock solely, but more the idea that you could go online and find pre-ready made artifacts, graphics, photos, videos, illustrations, um, that in this kind of present moment, we have so many resources online that could be accessed, um, good or bad, right? It has implications to this that you could go and buy an artifact and then put it as part of your design project um, and I think when working in industry, there's also this, you see this with royalty free photography and imagery as well, um, but it has an implication of uh, kind of really shifting how people begin to think. And, and I think it just jumping into kind of thinking about UX or UI sort of design, right? These kind of kits that are pre-ready that have, you know, the interface already sort of pre-built for you. You know, I think a lot about how that's shifting uh, you know, what we can conceptualize, right? There's sort of a, a faster way to get to an end. Um, but what does that mean? Like, what are the implications of, of that? Uh, and then, you know, between, like I said, thinking about devices, thinking about software, um, this other space that I have been really fascinated by is printing. And for me, you know, growing up, I, I learned printing through having like a dot matrix printer and you like perforated the edge, you tore it off. I remember creating like these early reports again in like in middle school, kind of using this kind of printer. Um, and, and I think as I, you know, kind of advanced into different spaces, whether it was high school and college, right? This was the world, so like inkjet printer, um, we're getting some HP ink cartridge that would like go out in 10 seconds. It was the worst. Like I still have one. I use it for scanning. Um, but the sort of the, it, it was what we had at that time to have like this kind of portable desktop printer in your home. Um, and I remember using it for some early design projects and then realizing like it just, the ink was not going to work. Um, and so moving to this kind of laser printing, um, having that be kind of like the uh, way to output faster, um, that's something that definitely has influenced in grad school. It was something that I found to be really helpful to kind of work through iterative, um, uh, kind of iterate, iterative uh, revisions and, and iterations of different things that I was working on. Um, and when I think about this in the context of my students, this is an image of our, uh, again, I teach at Parsons and this is our design lab. And on the 10th floor of, of our sort of space, basically we have access to these like mixture of laser printers. Um, and you can kind of see some of the work that's put up on the wall, but it's not without tension, right? I think toner, inkjet cartridges cost uh, an exorbitant amount. And so there's definitely questions about what does it mean to be having students print, um, particularly to pin up in the classroom. These are some images of, of my students who are pinning up mood boards, if you will, physically in the classroom space. Um, but knowing that like having a laser printer it would be, you know, faster to get through um, uh, more kind of thumbnails to have on your wall. Um, and then also like what does that tactility do for engagement and touching or circling or cropping with your hands, as opposed to some of the digital mood boarding that we have now um, that happens online. 
And so I, I definitely am someone who continues to kind of privilege this. I, I think there's something interesting about getting off the computer and being able to have access to like moving things physically around. And so I try to engage that and keep this part of my sort of teaching practice because I do think it's really important. And, and I think with tools like Rizograph where they're able to kind of experiment with um, you know, the same kind of tactility, right? That there's, there's a way to kind of think about design that um, still kind of keeps, I think, printing and the physical in mind. And so these are some images of, of the work from my students in a class that I taught called Black Visual Culture. Um, and there was just a sense of play. And I think there's a different way to play with, with design um, that, you know, definitely I, I see tension between the digital and the physical, um, but I, I still think that there's a current of interest in that space. And, and then when it comes to file storage, um, Again, I learned off of using like a three and a half inch floppy floppy uh, disk. Uh, this was the first way to save a file on a computer. Um, and, and I also had CDs as well. Like that was kind of a way to burn and to save and to reproduce. Um, but since that time, right, from using, you know, uh, thumb drives to external hard drives, there's been this kind of, again, um, making the kind of artifacts that holds that content smaller. Um, so much so that we now have kind of basically cloud-based storage, right? And there are implications to that as well. And I you know, don't have time to get into that specifically, but the way that it's shaped and influenced my teaching practice is that here's just a screenshot of um, my core five when I was teaching thesis um, an overview of the dashboard or the, the kind of space in which I held content for the course. And this has completely changed, like how I sort of am able to archive resources, um, update the syllabus, update assignments, have access to, for students to kind of be able to see information that's, um, you know, online and, you know, they can access it from their phone or their computer. Um, and so I think about like, the shifting of not having it only be in one place, but sort of accessible in this kind of way. Um, and then even if with my own work, these are just, this is a screenshot of some of the music sheet covers and like historical research that I'm doing where I could go to an archive and they can share back with me digital artifacts or assets that um, I might want to work with. And so I think that those things are completely wow. changing um, our engagement with uh, how we can, touch or to engage with artifacts that might be um, held technically in one place, but then could be made accessible in, in multiple. Um, and then just to kind of jump to kind of communication tools, um, I, my first phone was this phone on the left, this like Motorola peanut phone, um, and, and then kind of slowly moved into, you know, this kind of flip phone here. Um, but I'm completely mindful that we're in a space now where, where there's so many different kinds of digital devices. Uh, we're, we're designing across different mediums and there's a need to kind of think about um, how interfaces really are shifting our engagement um, depending on the medium, but also the scale, all of those things. And so when I think about like, again, having AOL Instant Messenger as like the first instance of trying to communicate, like I was on this like all the time. And I, I remember saving like conversations. I don't even know where there are, probably at my parents' house. But like, this was that first way of like connecting um, separate from the phone, but on the computer, right? Like how to engage in this sort of instant message space. And I think, again, the transition for us into platforms like Slack, um, platforms that, you know, allow us to work together in, in uh, multiple places, but also, you know, share content like Instagram. Um, you know, I have seen so much influence of, of like Instagram's power. And this, again, is an instance of my class, Black visual culture being shared in the sort of Instagram space as well. And there's a power to this where you can share that work, have folks engage with it, um, have, have your students be able to be interactive with it. Um, and I think these tools are so important uh, for how we communicate, 
um, that it really kind of influences our kind of uh, engagement. And then um, I and throw this one in here as well. Uh, how much do, time do I have, Juliet? Am I one more over? Uh, you are, you have two more minutes. Okay, you can I'm almost go done. a little bit over, you know, it's okay. We're good. Okay. Everybody's good, right? Okay. Everyone's good? Okay. So the, um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of highlight too, this is just a nod to like Parsons DT, like they do a really great job as well above um, kind of promoting content, uh, you know, guest speakers. And I think when I think about how, um, you know, design programs, but also design educators are sharing and circulating content in an Instagram space, like this just demonstrates like, again, given the challenges of the pandemic, but also ways that you can reach a broader, wider audience. Like I find that this is, has been really fascinating for me um, to see how we can sort of bridge across spaces um, using tools like Instagram. And, and I think quickly, just to kind of show in my classroom um, how Zoom has influenced, this is a, a screen grab of like a, a partnership, a Zoom partnership that I had with students um, in my class and Florida A&M students what it meant to be able to kind of share collectively uh, using a tool like this in you know two different places, um, and so I definitely feel like you know these engagements have really shaped and altered my classroom space, or working with uh, other design educators like in the Shift Conference, um, or in my own program where we have a Zoom kickoff, uh, which I can talk about later in, in the Q&A and then Pinterest as well, right? Like how Pinterest is made and influenced um, the way that people aggregate content. And, and I think lastly, like just the collaborative making that happens in like Figma or Moreau, um, you know, this is I think something that's really super helpful for, for us to kind of collectively see our work next to other work um, at the same time. Um, and, and I think in terms of video resources as well, I'll kind of end here, but that within my, my own program, we have a mass, like this massive video library. Um, so I think about the power of like creating resources for each other um, and what it means to use like Notion or, uh, you know, a platform like Vimeo to hold content um, for, for everyone at the same time. Um, so I'll pause there because I know I, I could keep going. I just uh, want to make sure that we're good on time. I mean, you can go on for another couple minutes if you want. Do we have time? I don't know. Like, this is a class. We, we can, yeah. I can't we have, see we have a little class. flexibility so in the discussion. The, so I don't know I how don't many slides, the, how many slides do you have? This is the last couple of slides. It's okay, a shout yeah, out to the PD students. Okay. So, I mean, the last thing I'll say, and I can't see the room, so I, I feel like I, I don't have the sensibility of it, but I, I just wanted to highlight all of that combined, all of those things that I'm sort of thinking about combined um, show up in my students' work. So um, whether they're thinking about building websites and responding to social political climate, um, there's these sort of ways that they're working and thinking about the digital and thinking about um, you know, how their design sort of responds or looks or echoes um, what they're seeing in uh, culture. And, and I also think that there's like a tension though of terms of how, how to develop that, how to make it look real or how to make it feel as though it's as seamless as possible. And so I, I, I think that, you know, when I think about students who are working in digital spaces or students who are working in, in kind of three-dimensional you know, spaces as well, there's a, there's a tension in wanting to sort of uh, have it look like something. And at the same time, you have students who are really pushing and wanting to, I think even Audrey said earlier, kind of responding to identity, um, having that still be part of the engagement of design, even if it might become a book. Um, and so I think that there's like a pushing and a pulling of responding to what they see um, but still a very much deep interest in tactile components. Um, and so the last project I'll show here is just a, a work by a student, former student, Yaya, who was really interested in um, kind of the, the kind of ways in which 
uh, film and cinematic design could be an inspiration for his own sort of thesis work. So I just leave us all with where will design go post internet? I don't know. We're in a crazy ass time. There's a lot of stuff happening. Um, I'm not sure, but hopefully we can talk about it in our Q&A. So thank you.